And all right, Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 12. We're going to begin reading in verse number 12. The Bible says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Verse 13, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth. In his strength. The title of the sermon this morning is The Appearance of Jesus. The Appearance of Jesus. I'm going to be preaching about what Jesus Christ looked like or what Jesus Christ look like, looks like today. I want you to go to Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 14. I want to begin with a very important point, and that is. When we are speaking of the image of Jesus Christ, we need to understand that we're not just speaking of the image of a man. We're not just talking about, hey, what does the man Jesus look like? Or what does this divine man look like? You know, some people will say that he is an archangel, right? You know, what does this archangel look like? You know, that's not what we're talking about. So we need to understand the identity of Christ. And when I say, hey, we're, we're, we are, we're going to study, we're going to look at you know, the appearance of Jesus, we need to understand the significance of that. Because this morning, what we're going to be looking at is the appearance of God. We're going to be looking at what God looked like or what God appeared like in human flesh and what He looks like today. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16 tells us, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. So Jesus Christ was not just a normal man. He was not just a man that was conceived, you know, divinely, and he's just a divine man that God brought forth. He was actually God, the one true Jehovah of the Old Testament, who came in human flesh and who dwelled and lived among his own creation. I want you to, uh, I'm going to read to you uh, from John chapter number 4, verse number 24. I forgot to paste that verse, but give me just a moment. I'm going to get there myself, and then we're going to look at Colossians 2. So there's a very important point that we need to understand about the, what the Bible teaches about the nature of God. Innately, God is a spirit. His, his essence, what he is made up of, if you will, is spirit. John chapter number 4, verse number 24 tells us this. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God just innately or, or naturally does not possess a human body or a physical body. He is a spirit. That's what he is. His essence, you talk about what is God's essence. You hear people talk about the essence of God all the time. What he is is spirit. God is a spirit. And because of that, he is invisible to us. We are not able to see God. You know, there are times in the Bible where men in this physical world, in this natural world, their eyes are open temporarily where they can perceive the spiritual world. But even if God tried to allow us to do that, the Bible tells us that no man would live. No man would live if God allowed us to do that. First Corinthians chapter number, I'm sorry, First Timothy chapter number 6 verse number 15 says this, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 16, who only hath immortality, Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, <coughs> excuse me, hath seen, nor can see. And then it goes on to say, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So that's a powerful statement. A couple of phrases there. It tells you very plainly, whom no man hath seen nor can see. So that's one of the first points that I want to embed into your mind this morning. No man hath seen God in his spiritual nature. And no man ever will. Ever will see God in his spiritual nature. God is a spirit and he is invisible to us. And it is not possible for us to look upon him or to perceive him in his innate nature. It is not possible. But here's the thing. God desires for us to know him. 
God desires for us to see Him and to behold Him. And God created us because He wants to have a relationship with us. You can see all throughout the Bible that in God that He desires to, for man to know Him and for Him to know man. That's why God made us. He wants to establish a relationship with us. And because of that, God became human flesh. He came down and he was born as a man and he took on human flesh and he was partakers of flesh and blood just as much as we are so that we could know him and so that we could behold and see God. And we do so in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Colossians chapter number 2 verse number 14. The Bible says this, in whom we have redemption through His blood. This is speaking of Jesus, of course. Even the forgiveness of sins. Verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So two things that we can learn from that. Number one, again, God is invisible. Whom no man has seen nor can see. He is invisible to us and that is because He is spirit. He is a spirit. So God is invisible in His nature. We're not going to be able to look at Him. You, no one has and no one will. But then it tells us this. Speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. He was that one true God who came down and was born on this earth as a man. And that is the image of God. If you want to see God, if you want to know what the Father looks like, if you want to know what Jehovah looks like, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. That's where it ends. When you look at Jesus, you are looking at that one true God. You are looking at He whom no man has seen nor can see when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is how we are going to see the Lord. John chapter number 14, verse number 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? And then he says this, He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Do you know what he means when he says, How sayest thou then, show us the Father? He's, he's, he's saying this, Why are you even asking that question? Why are you even asking me to show you the Father? You know what that means? There's nothing left. When you look at Jesus, you're looking at it all. That's why the Bible tells us, For in Him dwells, or dwelleth, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All of it. There's nothing missing. When you look at Jesus, and you see the image of Jesus, you are seeing the image of God. You are seeing the image of the Father. So we need to understand this, and the significance of when we're studying the appearance of Jesus, and what Jesus look like and is going to look like when we see Him, that we are actually studying what God looks like. And we are looking at and studying what Jehovah Himself appears like. So, God didn't give us a pictorial Bible. I want to say this in the beginning. You know, you know, God didn't have, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, when you get those Bibles, sometimes, you know, the pictorial Bibles, they'll have pictures in there, right? You know, when God had men, the prophets, write down the words that he spoke, it didn't come with a picture. You know, Jesus, you know, didn't sit there and model and, 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 and John, you know, drew a picture of him so that we could see exactly what he looks like, right? Now, uh, I want to make this statement too before I go any further. You know, uh, the Bible's very clear that it is a sin and it is, it is uh, you know, immoral and it is a transgression to draw a picture of God. You should never do that. You should never carve out an image. You should never draw a picture of God because God doesn't want you to worship that image. That's the reason why. So we should never sit down and draw a picture of God. But, but this is what we have to understand. There are a lot of details that are given about what God looks like. There are a lot of details that are given about Jesus' appearance. And the reason why He did so was for our learning and so that we would know and have these details about how Jesus appeared and what his image looked like. So this is important. Some people will just go way too far as to say, well, I don't ever want to think about it. It doesn't matter to me. You know, we'll just find out when we get to heaven. The Bible is for your admonition and for your learning and the things that are written down are for you to understand and God wants you to know who he is. That's the same reason why he came in the flesh, so that they who were on the earth could see him. And he also had details about his appearance, you know, characteristics uh, about his physical body that he had, 
that are pinned down and it's for your benefit. It's for us to know, it's for us to learn, and He wants us to know these things so that we can know Him better. So it's important to understand that God wants us to know Him and that we can learn from these things and see what Jesus looked like. And we're given a lot of details. Now I preached a sermon in the Godhead series that was about the image of God. And, and really, the whole focus of that sermon was to prove that Jesus was the image of God. Now, I've already done that. It's very easy. You know, some people are hard-headed and they just can't get it in their mind. So, I've already done that in the beginning of this sermon, in the introduction. And I didn't spend time on the details of Jesus' appearance. That wasn't the purpose of that particular sermon. But that's going to be the purpose of this sermon. We're going to look at what Jesus actually looked like as a man and how he appeared and some of the things that we can le learn about what his physical characteristics were. I want to begin in Isaiah chapter number 53. First, we're going to look at Jesus' earthly appearance. His earthly appearance. Isaiah chapter number 53 is the chapter of the suffering servant. We're given a lot of prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 53. There are a lot of pictures out there, you know, even though God had commanded not to draw pictures of him, you know, there's a lot of people that just didn't take heed to that. So there are multiple portraits out there, pictures out there, you know, paintings, different types of drawings that people will attempt to draw Jesus. And it's like they never even came to the Bible when they did this. It's like they knew nothing about the Bible. They're just, it's just about everything is in error about them. So we need to go to the Bible, of course. Everyone understands this. This is our authority. This is where we know everything about God. This is how we know who He is, that He came in flesh. And the Bible gives us a lot of details about it. So here in Isaiah chapter number 53, we're told some details about Jesus' appearance. Look with me at Isaiah 53 verse 2. It says this, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. <clears throat> now I want you to watch this. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Just about every portrait or just about every picture that you see of Jesus being drawn. Is he meant to be depicted as some hideous or ugly person? I'm not saying Jesus was necessarily hideous, but is he, is he, meant, is he at all distasteful at all? Or is he a very handsome man and you can tell that they're trying to make him look like he is a beautiful man? Every single portrait, every single picture you've ever seen is what? It makes Jesus look as if he is a very handsome man, doesn't it? The Bible is very clear that Jesus was not a handsome man. Jesus was not, the Bible used beauty here, it uses the word beauty, and the Bible says that he has no beauty. To look upon Jesus as far as his physical characteristics, he was not a handsome man. He was not a good looking man. The Bible uses the word also comeliness there. It says that he has no form nor comeliness. That's also another word to talk about the, the favor of someone's look. He was not well favored like the Bible says. He was not a good looking man. It makes it sound as if he could have possibly been even so far as ugly. It says he has no beauty. How does that sound? It says that he's, he's, not, he's obviously not good looking. He's the opposite of that. It sounds like he's not a very good looking man. And what's the reason? It tells you right there. It's important. Why he did that says there's no beauty that we should desire him. So people didn't, God didn't want people to be drawn to his looks or drawn to his appearance. They obviously what mattered was his words. What mattered was his message. So people weren't being partial about his appearance if they were following Jesus. That for sure wasn't the reason why people were following around. It was because of the word of God. And that's I believe why Jesus or why God caused you know the body that he took on to not be a beautiful body. So number one, one of the misconceptions about the appearance of Jesus is that he was not a good looking man. Every portrait that you can tell, the purpose of this portrait is to try to depict Jesus as being good looking. But Jesus was not good looking. Jesus was more so of a, a distasteful person to look at as far as his physical appearance. He was not beautiful or he was not comely. So that's point number one, he was not a good looking man. Another thing we can learn about his physical appearance go to Isaiah chapter number 50, verse number 6. People will debate about whether this is prophetic. I, I, I don't think it's a debate at all. I believe it's very clearly speaking about Jesus. It says in uh, verse number 6, it says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not, <coughs> excuse me, my face from shame 
and spitting. Now, number one, these things, the reason why I believe this is prophetic is because these things are actually fulfilled on Christ. They, you know, they spat at Christ. Number one, we can see that in Matthew 27. And what else we can see in Matthew 27 is them doing what? Scourging him. They are beating him. But the main reason why I believe that this is prophetic is because you can see that his suffering is voluntary. Notice that there is voluntary suffering that is going on. It says this, I gave my back to the smiters. It's the exact same language that is found in Isaiah 53, which is the suffering servant chapter, where he's giving himself repeatedly. He gave himself. He's giving himself. The one thing that we can learn about Jesus' appearance here is it says this, I gave my back to the smiters, and then he says this, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. So notice it says my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. So what are they doing? They're pulling hair off of his cheeks. Therefore, what did he have? He had hair on his cheeks. He had a beard. That's another thing that we can learn about Jesus is that Jesus, number one, he was not a good looking man. But number two, Jesus, while he was on this earth, Jesus had a beard. So we can see a few things that we're told these things. These things matter. There's a reason why the Bible includes these things so we can learn from them. All of the Bible matters. So we can see that Jesus, while on this earth, as a man, he had a beard. That is point number two. He had a beard. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. <clears throat> Isaiah 53 verse 4 and 5 say this, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem, esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. This, this just plays hand in hand with Isaiah 50. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our, of our peace was upon him, and, his, and with his stripes we are healed. So notice that scourging there. Just found a couple of chapters before this. One of the other misconceptions about Jesus is every time when you see a picture of Jesus... Virtually every time. This doesn't matter whether it's Baptist, you know, uh, Sunday school curriculum, material. I, wanna, I grew up in Christian schools almost my whole life. And every time they depict Jesus, you know what he has? He has long hair. Every single time. Jesus did not have long hair. We are clearly told that Jesus had short hair. I want you to look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 go through here uh, quite a few verses. Look at verse number 3. It says this, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. So notice that the head of every man is Christ. And it says, And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Verse 4, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Now that statement there, Verse number four has a double meaning. Number one, it's saying you're dishonoring your head, your physical head, your own physical head, right? It's a dishonorment to yourself. But then it also has a secondary meaning, and it's saying that you are dishonoring your head, which is who? Which is Christ. So notice that if a man covers his head, that is dishonorable to who? To Christ, to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Now, what does it mean to cover your head? Look at verse number... 15. It says this in verse number 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. And then it tells you, for her hair is given her for a covering. So what is the covering? It is hair, right? So and in that particular verse, it told us that if she has long hair, that's good because it's given her for a covering. So what is the covering specifically in that verse? It's long hair, to be specific. Notice that. It's having long hair. Go back to verse number 4. It tells us every man prophesy, uh, praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So what does that mean in context? It means having long hair. What does it do? It dishonors his head. It's dishonoring to yourself and it's dishonoring to Christ, your head. Look for, further, verse number 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, that's not having long hair is what that means, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So if she had short hair, it's just as bad as, as if her whole head was shaved. Right? That's what that's saying. Verse 6. For if the woman be not covered, that's talking about having long hair, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, which it is, he's just proving a point here, 
Let her be covered. So if it's shameful for a woman to have her, it's saying this. If you're going to have your hair short, you might as well just shave off your whole head, right? But if it, and then a person would be like, oh, I don't want to do that. And then he says to them, hey, well, if that's shameful, then you might as well just grow your hair out long. That's the point that he's making here. Now look at verse number six. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now look at verse seven. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Now again, what does that mean? Have long hair, right? For as much, now this is the reason why, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. So I want you to notice there that the Bible tells you that man is not supposed to have long hair. And what is the reason? Because he is meant to be in the image or the appearance of what God looks like. You notice that? He is made in the image of God. So if you just stop and think about this for just a couple of minutes and you're, you know, we're told by the Bible that it is shameful then that man is not supposed to have long hair because it is dishonoring to Christ. And then we're told, look, flip over and let's use this in tandem as well. Look at verse number 14 because I didn't read that yet. It says this, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? And we're told specifically that if a man has long hair, would it make sense that Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ, while he lived on the earth, had long hair? Of course not. Because it would be, number one, what? Shameful. And then number two, we're told that we are not supposed to have long hair because that would be shameful to Christ. Why? Because we are supposed to look like Christ. Now, would it make sense that we're allowed that that you know uh, we can't have long hair, but he has long hair, and we're shaming him uh, by having long hair when he himself has long hair? That doesn't even logically make any sort of sense. And then, the, the, you know, here's the thing: all you have to do is show people verse number 14 in the first place. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. Right. So, if Jesus had long hair, he was a shame. And sin is oftentimes associated with. Shame. He would have been ashamed to God. God would have looked at him and, and thought, that's shameful. And if you see men with long hair, it is shameful. What does it mean to be shameful? It's embarrassing. Right. Have you ever seen a man, you know, put his hair up yeah. or take his hair down? It's embarrassing. There's a guy that I was working with recently, uh, and I like this guy a lot, but he has long hair. And you can tell that he even knows it's embarrassing and it's shameful. He's always keeping it up. And he'll have his hard hat on. But you know what he does if he's going to take it down? He walks over to his truck and he opens the door and he takes his hair down for a minute. Puts it back up in a bun and puts his hard hat on. Why don't you do that out here in front of all of us? You know why? Because you're embarrassed. Because you know that you look like a woman. That's why. You, it's shameful and women, it's a feminine look. Right. Having long hair is feminine. It's meant to be a glory and it is specifically a feminine glory. When women have long hair, it makes them look more feminine. When women have short hair, they look masculine and they look like a man. And it's embarrassing and it's shameful when men are whipping their hair around. And they look like a woman. That's why it's embarrassing because they look like a woman. So to, to say that Jesus Christ had long hair is blasphemy. It's to say that Jesus Christ looked like a woman and to say that Jesus was shameful and that he was a shame. Jesus Christ had short hair. So all of these depictions and portrayals of Jesus having long hair, they're false. 100% right. false. And like, you know, you have the, uh, uh, the, the portrait of, of uh, supposedly Jesus, but it's actually Caesar Borgia. And what does he look like? He has long hair, doesn't he? That's where most of these came from. You know, all of the, you know, it, ever since that particular portrait, that became popular. People are using that as their basis when they think of, you know, what Jesus looks like. And all of these Baptists, when they're drawing up their school material and their curriculum, they're basically thinking of Caesar Borgia when they're drawing, you know, Jesus, right? Jesus Christ did not have long hair. He had short hair. He was a manly man and he had a beard. And he was not a handsome man. These are three good points that we can learn about the appearance of Jesus. We're taught these things and they're important. We should, we should uh, embrace these teachings. I want you to turn with me to uh, Luke chapter number 20. We'll look at his clothing quickly. Luke chapter number 20. And, and ironically, all the details that we're given pretty much about Jesus... We're not given a lot, and almost all of them 
The world, when they portray Jesus, they do the exact opposite. Isn't that weird? You know, sometimes even Christians, we're not given, think about that, we're not given hardly any details, like five, six details. But when someone sits down to draw Jesus, they do the exact opposite of the only details we're given almost every time. So it's very strange. Look at Luke chapter number 20, verse number 46. We can learn something uh, <clears throat> about Jesus' clothing and how he dressed. Look at verse number 45. Then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and so forth and so forth. When you see a picture of Jesus or a portrait that's drawn of Jesus, what is he wearing? A long robe every single time. He's got long hair and he's got on a long robe. Now would it make sense that Jesus is standing here in the audience of the people and he's got on a long robe and he's telling you, hey, beware of men that wear long robes. Beware of them. Would that make sense? It's ridiculous. It makes zero sense. People are like looking at each other like, what in the world is he talking about? No, Jesus did not go around in long robes. Now, if you look at, this is interesting, and I noticed this when I preached on the sermon about uh, the common people, right? Heard him gladly and how the common people are the ones that receive the word of God. If you look at the parallel to this in, in uh, Mark chapter number 12, it's like verse uh, uh, 40 something. It's later in the chapter, or maybe 30, 30, 38, 39, I think it is. Jesus, right before that, actually says that it talks about the common people hearing him gladly and that the, the audience here is actually referring to the common people. Then he makes this statement about, hey, beware of them that go in long robes. You know what that tells me? That the common people, of course, didn't wear long robes. The common man just dressed normally. How normal common people dress today. That's how they dress. And it was the scribes. And why did they do that? The scribes and the Pharisees. Because they were proud, they were bombastic, they wanted to draw the attention unto themselves. I mean, if somebody walked in here in a long row, have you ever been to a wedding maybe that was conducted you know, at a Catholic church? You know, uh, you know, probably you have. What do the priests look like? Exactly like what's being described here. And do you know what happens when they walk in? It just causes everyone to turn their eye and look at them, right? You know, they have their ceremonial gowns on and they come in. That's what it is. It's like a gown. It's a dress is what it is. And it causes everyone to look at them. That's the reason why they do that in the first place. Because you know what he says after that? Look at this. And the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts. So what's his point? They're not happy dressing and looking like the common people. They want to stand out. They want to receive what? The praise of men. They want to receive the glory of men. And all of the Catholics and all of these other religions today that dress in the same way, a way in which it causes you to draw your attention towards them, why do they do that? Because they love the praise of men. Because they love people to look at them and to think, hey, I'm better than you. I'm more special than you. You know, uh, you know they, they, they walk in and, and, they, and they look ridiculous, obviously, in the first place. You know, they look like a woman. Isn't that, a, isn't that weird? That, that's what I was thinking just now is Jesus is depicted with long hair, looking like a woman, and then they put a dress on him as well. It's like, what in the world is wrong? And that's how the world is. It's so bizarre and weird. They get everything backwards. Can't trust anything from the world. Right. Uh, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I'm going to touch on for a moment the controversial aspect, and I've spoke about this a few different times, of Jesus's appearance. And this is going to be his skin color or his skin pigmentation. Now someone may say or someone may think immediately when I start to talk about this, you know, why does that matter? Well let me ask you this question first to get to why you just thought that. If you did or if someone maybe listens to this and thinks that. Do you think that the other things that I just preached to you matter? Of course they do. You think that it would be right to avoid those or ignore those? No. Why? Because it's in the Bible, right? So if we're taught things and we can purge truths from the Bible, there's a reason why they're there, right? Now, now let me say this as well. Does, it, 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 whether Jesus is black, white, brown, whatever color that he has, does that mean that that skin color causes him to be, that skin color is more superior because maybe a person shares the same skin color as him? But is it important if it's in the Bible? Everything in the Bible is important. Everything. And if you think that, well, this doesn't matter, let's just ignore it. You're being brainwashed by this political correctness, racist crap. And a lot of times what it is, it, here's the thing, if I were to stand up here and preach to you right now that Jesus was a black man, nobody would bat a stinking eye, would they? Nobody would say a word. They wouldn't care at all. 
But today, there is this, this um, you know, uh, what's the political word for it when it's like white shaming, if you will? You know, everybody else will oftentimes, they'll stand up, you know, a black person could stand up if they wanted to and say, hey, you know, uh, I believe that Jesus is black. And nobody would say, hey, you're racist at all, would they? They'd say, oh, well, you just believe Jesus is black, right? But if I stood up here and preached that I thought that Jesus was white, what would people say about me? They'd say I'm a racist, wouldn't they? They would say I'm a racist. Now, if the Bible taught that Jesus was black, do you know what I would stand up and preach to you? Jesus was black. I don't give a rip what Jesus' skin color looks like as far as I have no preconceived ideas. But if the Bible teaches me something, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to preach it to you whether or not you like it or not. Whether or not. And I don't care. If you get mad that I preach that Jesus has a beard, I don't have a beard. Right? So I just a moment ago told, told you that Jesus had a beard. That doesn't matter to me. Right? I am interested in the truth. And oftentimes those groups, whether it's a black guy standing up and saying that Jesus is black or it's a white guy standing up and preaching that Jesus is white, a lot of times they are saying that because they want their race to be superior. But the Bible does actually give us hints or clues as to the appearance of the Israelites and the appearance of Jesus himself. We could purge truths from this. I want you to go to Lamentations chapter number 4. Lamentations chapter number 4. right after the book of Jeremiah. It's also authored by Jeremiah. The book of Lamentations, <clears throat> chapter number 4. We're going to look at a few things here. <clears throat> and I've, I've heard, obviously there's a lot of different people that have different you know, opinions on this, but there are things that we can learn in the Bible uh, on this particular subject. I want you to look with me at Lamentations, chapter number 4, verse number 7. It says this, Her Nazarites were purer than snow. Now when it says the Nazarites there, that, that is not you know, someone that is from you know, uh, uh, Nazareth. A Nazarite is a vow. They can be of any, na of, any of the uh, uh, you know, tribes within the nation, right? So it could be someone that's you know, of the, uh, what's, what's a tribe? You know, Gad, it could be someone that's from Zebulun, it could be someone that's from Asher, it doesn't matter, right? That could, they could be a Nazarite. So it's, it's talking about basically anyone that's an Israelite. And it says this, her Nazarites were purer than snow. Now, were, is that present or past tense? Past tense. Were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. Now, when it says purer than snow, it's repeated and it says whiter than milk. What is it telling you about them looking like snow? Is it the texture of snow? No, it's the color of snow, right? And it says they were purer than snow and then it says they were whiter than milk. They were more, now this is important as well, ruddy in body than rubies. Now I've heard people say, well this is spiritual, right? This is spiritual. Notice that it said they were more ruddy in body than rubies. So it's talking about their physical bodies. It's talking about their physical appearance. And it says the word ruddy. Now does everyone know what the word ruddy means? The word ruddy means, it comes from the word red. And specifically, when you say someone is ruddy, this word isn't used very often today, but it's talking normally about the fact that you are able to blush in the face. The fact that you are able to see red in your face. Now you have to be fairly white in order to be able to see the red in someone's face. So that's important to understand. Notice it says they were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Now watch verse 8. Their visage is. Now is that past tense, present, or future? Present. So notice there's a change now, isn't there? Their visage is. What's a visage? It's physical appearance. So what were we just talking about? Physical appearance. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. So notice this is a dramatic change in the sense of how they looked before. They're not known in the streets. They're unrecognizable to those that you know, knew who they were. They're not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. So notice that naturally or before something had affected them, they were what color? They were white. And now what are they? They are black. Now, is there really anyone who is white? Like, Brother Rick's shirt is white. Is there anyone that is that color white? No. Is there really anyone that is black? Not really, right? No one is really white and black. It's just terms that we use to describe a, a color. And it's, you know, 
whether or not you're closer to this or you're closer to this basically there's like this line that people draw right that most of the most of the time that's how people be you're either white or black right and that pretty much how our world like tries to view people you're either white or black right so basically what it's doing here it's it's saying that prior to this what color were they in their natural state closer to white were they closer think about that were they closer in their natural state were they closer to black or were they closer to white they would have been closer to white. Now, do I believe that it's saying they're like a white European? No. Right? If we look over in the Middle East, there's definitely a difference between people that are in like Turkey, right? Or people that, are, that, that live in Syria or Lebanon. There's a difference in them than there is in like Europeans, aren't they? But if you looked at them, would you say they're white or black? They're white. Tur a Turkish person, they're white. Someone from Lebanon or Syria, are they white like me or white like you, most of you, right? No. But they're still white. You would still say that person is white. So naturally notice that the Nazarites, they're referred to as being white, aren't they? They're talked about and look, when they look at them, they're white. But then there's a change in their appearance and what do they look like now? Now they look like they are black. So naturally they're white. I want you to go to Song of Solomon chapter number 5. That's just the whole nation basically being described as being somewhat of a white color. Now Jesus was from Israel, wasn't he? He was from the nation of Israel. So it makes sense that Jesus was more so white. That would make sense. Look at Song of Solomon chapter number 5. Song of Solomon chapter 5, look at verse number 9. It says this. This is Song of Solomon's wife speaking. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? This is actually someone speaking to, to Song of Solomon's wife here. Or to Solomon's wife. Song of Solomon's wife. To Solomon's wife. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, that thou dost so charge us? Now here's the response of Solomon's wife. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousands. How is Solomon described by his wife as being white and ruddy isn't he white and ruddy so his appearance is more so what more so white and he's ruddy saying that he he can he can be pink in the face or he can be red in the face so he's pretty fairly white isn't he if he's able to be red in the face that's Solomon right he's white and ruddy, ruddy. we're given more details also about Solomon's appearance as well look at verse number 11 his head is as the most fine gold watch this his locks are bushy and black as a raven what color hair did he have Solomon he had black look at people in Syria look at people in Turkey look at people in Lebanon do you know what they look like they most of them are white you know what color hair that they have black a pitch black really dark hair that's what they have those are people that stayed in the Middle East the Jews that are there now they went up and, you know, they intermingled with a lot of the Europeans and then they came back and now they have blue eyes. A lot of them have blonde hair. But though they know a difference between a lot of the Jews that stayed. And, you know, the Jews that stayed, do you know what their appearance looks like? They look white and they look like they have very dark, dark black hair. Often they have pitch black, dark hair. Notice it says that he's white and ruddy. I want to read to you about David. David was his father. It makes perfect sense. It says in 1 Samuel 17 verse 42, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. Notice that he's, he's ruddy. Now, you know, uh, I, I want you to think about this as well. You know, Jacob and Esau, right? When Esau was born, what does it tell you? What are the attributes about Esau that you're, you're told? He's red all over like a hairy garment, right? So I know the black Hebrew Israelites say that that means like his skin's red, right? And he, can, he burns in the sun. No, it, it's talking about him being hairy and his hair, he, the hair that he had on his body was red. We're told later that he is a hairy man. So he had red hair. That's why it's pointed out because I would assume Jacob had black hair. I would assume that he had black hair. There's obviously a difference with the two and Esau had red hair. Now this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the ruddy aspect but if we look around today you know uh, and we look at different ethnical groups the people that it's more common that will have red hair are people that are what? Pigmentation. White. So doesn't that make perfect sense that they're more of a white base or more of a white pigmentation that they would be red? Brother Anthony pointed something out to me when we were talking about this in the past. 
uh, is pretty interesting. That it talks about one time when a judgment comes upon the people of God, the Israelites in the Old Testament. It says that they, they went pale. Now, have you ever seen a black African American go pale? No, you couldn't. It's not possible. They wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to tell whether they were pale. Just like you wouldn't be able to tell whether they were ruddy. You wouldn't be able to, you can't, you know, because they're not, their skin color, the, the, the hue of their skin is not white enough to be able to see that, right? Not only that, there's a couple other points that just debunk totally, like, it's, it's totally ridiculous to try to say that they were like African Americans, like of, of, of what, what would be referred to as Negro stock, right, where they have literally kinky hair. I'll give you two other points on top of that that debunk that totally. You know, um, Mary washed Jesus' feet with what? The hairs of her head. Okay, can you imagine? And I'm not trying to ridicule or be, you know, cruel, but can you imagine a black woman, an African American woman washing another man's feet with the hairs of her head. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. You know, obviously there's a difference in how you know, African hair grows, right? And they, they you know, uh, it's very hard for them to grow their hair, number one. But number two, their hair doesn't grow out. You know, uh, basically every other, you know, ethnical group that you would consider, they could wash someone's feet with the hairs of their head, couldn't they? Right? A white person could wash another person's feet with the hairs of their head, right? So you, that right there makes no sense. It would be basically impossible. They'd have to be like rubbing their head. It would be ridiculous, right? It's not possible. So that right there debunks it. That's another one. I'll give you another one about the hair, right? Uh, Absalom. What did Absalom do every year? He pulled his hair. Pull is just another word for cut. And what does it tell you that's interesting about his hair? That it's extremely heavy, the weight of it, right? I don't know if you know this, but African American hair is like the lightest hair on the face of this earth. It is like as light as a feather if you've ever held it in your hand. There's a major difference, let me say this as well, between every other ethnical group's hair than African American hair. Major difference. And not only that, their hair grows much, much, much slower. You know, a white man would be able to grow his hair out real fast, right? And have long hair like Absalom did. And when he cut it, it could be heavy like that, right? That is not physically possible for an African-American man. It's not possible. The, the uh, weights that are given, it's not possible. So when we, the physical characteristics that were given of the Israelites, they don't match up with an African-American at all. We're told that they're white. Their hair is black, right? It's bushy and black. That perfectly describes those in the Middle East. It's not a white European, nor is it a black African man. It's a Middle Eastern man. And that's what Jesus looked like. These are things that we can learn from. And Jesus came specifically of the seed of Solomon, didn't he? He came from the seed of Solomon. Now, all of the Israelites are, were, talked about, were talked about as being white, right? Specifically, Solomon... And David are talking about being white and ruddy and having black hair. So it would, it would be very safe to assume that Jesus himself was, number one, we know he was not a handsome man. Number two, he had a beard, right? Jesus had a beard. Number three, he had short hair. He did not have long hair, he had short hair. And number four, it would be very safe to assume that Jesus was a white man. He would be more so considered white. I'm sure he was darker than most of the white people in here, but he would still be considered white and he had black hair, black bushy hair. These are very safe assumptions or things that we are taught from Scripture that we can learn about the appearance of Jesus. And they matter, right? Does it, does it mean that, you know, that if somebody has the same skin color as him that they're more superior than you? That's ridiculous. That's just like saying that if you share the same eye color that he had. You know, I have the same eye color Jesus had. That's ridiculous. Skin color, all of those things, none of that matters at all. That is not what matters as far. Salvation, that's ridiculous. Now, is it important? It's in the Bible. We should still study it. We shouldn't stray away from things because the world tries to pressure you into not talking about it or there's groups out there that will maybe call you a racist. You know, in my Black Hebrew Israelite video, I'll make it, I made and I'm, I'm talking about how they're racist. And I actually, at the end, I explain like, hey, you know, as far as skin color, it doesn't matter. This is what the Bible teaches, but it doesn't matter at all. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, right? And, you know, the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. We'll all be saved. God has made all nations of one blood, right? None of that matters. And then there's people commenting on there like, 
you're you're a stinking racist. You white supremacist. You know, it's like, you know, it doesn't matter if you if I were to stand up here and say that Jesus was black, no one would say that. Not a single person would say that. But just because the day and age that we live in, you know, I'm white and I happen to say he's white, people act like I'm a racist because of it. Well, I don't give a crap whether that offends anybody. I don't, because here's the thing, it doesn't matter whether it's this subject or whether it's another subject. If the Bible teaches it, I'm preaching it whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter. That's the point. And that's, what you, and that's why I said before I got into this, did the stuff before matter? Oh yeah, it mattered. But then if I start talking about the skin color, people are like, well, we don't need to really worry about that. Why? Because it's a sensitive subject to people today. I don't care whether it's sensitive to you or not. Amen. The Bible tells us these truths. We can learn from them. We can study them. We can come to, you know, uh, 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 you know we can at least have conjecture about them. We can know for a fact the color of Solomon, right? So these are things we can learn, and it's in the Bible for a reason, and you should never allow, you know, political correctness, you know, societal, you know, controversies to determine whether or not you're going to talk about something in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, preach about it no matter what, you know, nuts to the world. Turn to Revelation chapter number one. We're going to look at quickly Jesus in his glorified form. So that was Jesus... You know, speaking of how he looked earthly. So we're going to go through this much quicker. We're going to look at Jesus now in his, in his glorified form. Because Jesus, of course, died, was buried, and he rose again. He rose from the dead. He gave us salvation by doing so. And uh, he went to heaven and he received a glorified body. And we someday also will receive a glorified body. We're told that it's going to be like unto his. Amen. Right? So we can look here. and We're told again about what Jesus looks like. And he wants us to know these things. Because he wants us to know him. Look at Revelation chapter number 1 where we began. Verse number 12. It says this, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So what does he look like? Son of Man is just another way of saying a man. Obviously, a son of man comes from a man, right? So he's just saying, he looks like a man. That's what he looks like when he looked at him, right? The Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. Now, I want you to notice that now he has on a garment that's down to the foot, isn't it? Right. When he came the first time, Jesus came humbly, right? He had prerogatives. He had things that he could have claimed. He was the King of kings and Lord of lords. But you know when he came? He lived as just a normal, average man. When Jesus comes back, he doesn't come back like that. He comes back, he's received his glorified body, he comes back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He comes back, and he rightfully is so, and you know what? He can wear a garment down to the foot now. He is the God of gods and the King of kings, and this is something that he deserves himself. That's why he can dress this way. He's something to look at. You know, they wanted to dress up that way to look at, look at me, look at me, right? Jesus is really something to look at. He's the creator of all the earth, and he, he can dress in, he needs to dress in whatever way to bring as much attention to him, right? Look at Revelation chapter number 1, verse number uh, 13 at the very end there. It says this, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. So he has on a golden belt, right? That draws attention. He's dressed like what? Like a king, right? So he has on pants all the way down. Uh, he has on a golden belt that's going on around his waist. That's what a girdle is. It's a belt. Verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool. And it says this, as white as snow. So he has white hair. When you look at him, Jesus has white hair. Now, I believe that this is as white as wool, literally as white as snow. Now, before when he was talking about white... You know, that was like, you know, uh, how we would describe him, either white or black. The reason why I believe this now is because when he's described, when Jesus is described in, in, in every single appearance, he's always what? He's always shining. He's always like lightning to look at. So I believe that he is literally extremely white, like a, like a white, bright light. And that's how his hair even appears as well. So his head and his hairs are white like wool as white as snow. So extremely white, pure white. And then it says this, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now, um, you know, I want you to, let's, let's keep your hand here and I want you to go over to Daniel chapter number 10. Daniel chapter number 10. We're going to compare uh, Revelation 1 with a couple other passages uh, real quick and then we're going to be finished for this morning, maybe another 10 minutes or so. Daniel chapter number 10 Look at verse number four. We're talked about, or we're told about a uh, another appearance of, I believe, Jesus Christ. It's almost identical appearance. It says in verse four, uh, or look at verse, look at verse five. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man 
clothed in linen. Now, doesn't that sound the same? Like a son of man, a man, right? He's clothed in linen. It's all the same. Whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. Notice that exact same description. He's got on that golden belt. It's fine gold. What does that mean, fine gold? It's been refined. That's what that means. It's been purified. Verse 6. His body also was like the barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning. So notice when you look at his face, what is it like? It's bright. Lightning is like a bright white, an extremely white light. So that's how his whole face looked, right? So this isn't just his hair, right? So I, I, when I uh, you know, made that video, a lot of people responded to like, yeah, when it says head you know, and hair, it's just repeating the same thing. No, it's not. When it says his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, it's his head, everything above his shoulder, because here in Daniel 10, it says his face as well. That's his face, specifically is what? It's bright, it's white, like lightning. His head and his hairs, both, are bright and white like lightning. Now look at verse number 6 afterwards. After the word lightning there, the next clause it says, And his eyes as lamps of fire. So his eyes, like over in uh, Revelation 1... It words and it says that it is <clears throat> as a flame of fire is exactly how it's worded. As a flame of fire, it says in Revelation 1. And then in Daniel 10, it says as lamps of fire. So his eyes, when you look at his eyes, you know, it's not like looking at pupils, right, or your iris. It doesn't look like my eye when you look at my eye or another human's eye. It's like a lamp of fire. It's like a burning flame inside of his eye. And he's just completely pure white. And it's a shining white. I mean, that's fearful. The contrast between those colors, too, would be extremely fearful to look upon. I mean, that makes you understand why John falls down. And he's fearful immediately. You know, can you imagine walking in a dark alley and a guy steps out and his face is just as white as snow. He's got white as snow hair. He's like, his face is like lightning as well. It's shining. And then you look at his eyes and it's like he turns around and looks at you and he's got like flames inside of his eyes. They're red. Yeah, I'd fall down too. Yeah, I'd be scared as well, right? So this is what the Lord Jesus Christ looks like in His glorified body, His glorified appearance. Then it says this, And His arms and His feet liken color to polished brass. So His arms and His feet. So this is basically the rest of His body outside of His face, it looks like. His arms and His feet is what you're able to see. That's, that tells you... That his arms, you know, and I would assume that he's got on a t-shirt. I don't know that, you know. Uh, I don't know if he's got on a cut-off sleeve or not. I would assume he's got on a t-shirt, right? But uh, his arms, you're able to see his arms. And you're able to see his feet. Everything else is co covered, right? You know, maybe he's got some guns. I wouldn't be surprised. But, you know, you can see his arms. You can see his feet. Everything else is covered. Every other part of his body is covered. And what does it look like? Polished brass. Now, what does polished brass look like? It's very shiny as well, isn't it? It's extremely shiny. Now, if you look at polished brass, it basically looks like gold, except it's a little tiny bit lighter. It's a tiny bit lighter. Now, is polished brass, and, and here's the thing, I don't even believe that this has anything to do with his earthly form or his earthly body. This isn't like telling me like, you know, what he looked like in his earthly body, right? But black Hebrew Israelites will try to use this verse, and they're twisting it, and it matters. You need to understand what it actually means. They'll try to make it sound like this is proving that he's black. Well, number one, this is his glorified body. It has nothing to do with his physical body and the body that he got as an Israelite. You know, his face, is that what he looked like when he walked around? No, you know. I don't know what eye color he had, but I'm sure it's not flame of fire eye color, right? So that has nothing to do with his earthly body. But it, so it's, po it's like polished brass. Polished brass is like, like most doorknobs that are cheaper. They're normally made of brass, right? You have nickel and you have brass are the cheaper doorknobs. Nickel is like a silver. It's like a knockoff silver, basically. It's the cheaper of that type of color. Brass is like the same as gold, but cheaper. It's what people go to instead of gold, right? And it's a lot, lot, uh, uh, it's a little bit, let's say not a lot, a little bit lighter than gold. It's far from being a dark black color, right? This isn't proving that he was white in the first place, but it's not a dark black color. People will say that it's, uh, uh, in Revelation 1, the black Hebrew Israelites will say about the, verse number 15, it says this, And his feet like unto fine brass. They'd be like, uh, uh, look at the next part. As if they burn in a furnace. And they're like, you know, you ever looked up brass burning? You know, it's, it's a dark black color. This is not saying that his feet are burning right now. That's not what it's saying. 
Notice it said fine brass. What does that mean? Fine mint, exactly. It's been burned already. It's refined. It means it's already been purged of all the dross and it's been taken out and it's cold and everything. It's fine brass when you look at it. It's, it's completed. It's, at the, it's a finished product. It's completed, right? So that's what that's referring to. It's fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. And you compare that, look over at Daniel 10 again, and notice that it says, and his feet like in color to what? Polished brass. So is this still burning? You know, you polish it while it's still on fire and it's melting? No, it's, it's, po it's polished brass. It's a completed product. It's, what's the point? It's shining. Why do you polish it? To get it to shine. Over and over, and over again, you're, you're told different things about Jesus' appearance and His glorified body. You know what the emphasis is on? He's bright. He's shining. Lightning. When they see Him, when uh, Peter, James, and John go up into the Mount of Transfiguration, and He's transfigured before, his eye, before their eyes, what does He look like? He looks shining and bright. What's his clothes like? White. Like, as if no fuller on earth. You know, that a fuller is someone who cleanses his clothes and makes them, bleaches them and makes them white. The purpose is that he's very bright. The clothes are bright white. His body is bright white. That's why it's polished. He's bright. He's standing before them. It's a fearful sight. It's a strong sight. What is it like when you look at something that's extremely bright? It'll hurt your eyes. Yeah, it's hard to look at. That is how it is to look at the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's fearful and it's hard to look at. Look at Daniel chapter number 10 at the end. It says this, And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. So notice when he speaks now in his glorified body, it's like the voice of a multitude. It's like hearing, you know, if we had you know, 200 people in here singing a hymn, that's like when he speaks by himself, that's how loud his voice is. That's how powerful the voice of God is when he talks to you. It's like the voice of a multitude. You know, the, you know his decibel level by himself is that equal to multiple men speaking at the same time. It tells you also in Revelation chapter number 1 at the end there as well, it says, and his voice as the sound of many Waters. Have you ever stood, stood next to waters when they're crashing down like a waterfall? It's loud, man. It, you can hardly hear another person speaking next to you. It's so loud. You know, it's, it's extremely loud. What's the point? Speaking about the volume of his voice. And, and, and one of the reasons why this is, I believe, clearly a parallel in speaking about you know, Jesus is because of the order that we're given. You notice that it was the exact same order. How it goes, it starts with you know, his face, it starts with his eyes, then it goes to his, uh, his arms and his feet, and then it goes to what? Uh, his voice, the voice of many waters. It's, it's very clearly, I believe, a parallel. Go to Daniel 7 again now. Daniel chapter number 7. And we're given some uh, information as well here in Daniel 7. We're going to compare that to Revelation 1. And a moment ago we compared Revelation 1 with the polished brass and then the fine brass. And notice how we were able to kind of you know, get some more specific details in Daniel chapter number 10. That kind of helped us more so understand Revelation 1. You know, that it's polished. We now know that it's polished brass, right? Well, it's always important to compare Scripture with Scripture. Here in Daniel 7, it says this in verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Who's the Ancient of Days? It's the Lord, right? It's the Creator. You know, he's, it's saying, you know, He that is of eternity. It's a reference to the fact that He, you know, like He says in the book of Isaiah, he sa it says, Thus saith the High and Lofty One, I am He that inhabiteth eternity. That's the Ancient of Days. This is God that's, that's seated here. It says, Whose garment was white as snow. So notice that same uh, description. His garments white as snow. Then it says this, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. So notice there that the hair of his head is like the pure wool. Now if we compare that to Revelation 1, in what way is his hair like wool? It's white. You know, and, I, and this is another thing, you know, the black Hebrew Israelites have brought up and the it truly is ridiculous to have to keep. Their arguments are so ridiculous to bring up. But a lot of people are confused by this. A guy at my work even, that's, he, he grew up a Baptist his whole life. He had heard this stuff and was like, yeah, I mean, sounds like Jesus is black. And I was explaining to him, he's like, oh, it's, I was so stupid even to think that. You know what I mean? That's ridiculous. But when it says that it's as pure wool, it's also referring to it as being white. If you, you know, why would you refer to the texture of wool saying that it's, that it's pure? in referring to the texture. It doesn't make any sense. If something's pure, you know what it is? It's clean. That's what it's saying. You know, the Bible talks about in Revelation, I believe it's 14, that we're going to receive, uh, you know, the robes, and it says that they're pure and white. 
You know, it's, when it says pure there, you know what it's referring to again? It's referring to the color that they've been cleansed, that they are pure and white. When something is pure, that means it's clean. When it says the pure wool, his hair is white, it's saying that it's as white as snow. And that's why it says in Revelation 1 afterwards, as white as wool, right? Remember, it used the word pure as well in uh, Lamentations chapter number 4. It said pure as, was it wool? And then as white, it says purer than milk. That's what it says, or whiter than milk. Purer than something, whiter than milk. Purer than snow, it says, whiter than milk. So what was purer there? It was white. It's referring to the color, whiter than milk. So pure is referring to the color. It's ridiculous. Compare scripture with scripture. You know, if you're like purer than wool, what does that mean? Is it like, you know, real kinky and tight? No, it's white. That's what it means. It's purer than wool. He has white hair, right? And uh, notice what it says further. It says, white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. And then it says, his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as a burning fire. So notice that it's, that it's a fearful sight to look upon. Uh, go to Revelation chapter number 19. I'm out of time, so we're just going to end there. You know, if you'd like to, you could read, and we've, I've read this a few times from the pulpit. You can go to Isaiah chapter number 63. It gives you the same description. You can also go to Genesis 49, and we're given some details about how Jesus looks in his glorified appearance. You know, it's, it says that his eyes are red with wine. And I've heard people say, oh, that's, you know, that's because he's drunk. You know, that's just as blasphemous as Jesus having long hair. You know, the, the, that's, that's ridiculous. That's blasphemous. You know, the, the, we're told not to even look at wine, not to touch it, to stay away from it. To say that Jesus is getting drunk, that is wicked as hell. Jesus didn't, was not drinking the poison of asp and the cruel venom of serpents. He was not drinking that. You know what it's saying? Compare scripture with scripture, fool, before you say blasphemous things. It's saying that his eyes were like lamps of fire. It's saying that his eyes were as a flame of fire. He had red eyes. That's what it means. That's what it means. That's all that it means. He had red eyes. And then it also tells you in Genesis 49 that his garment was dipped in blood. You know, uh, it's worded in a different way. It's talking about grapes. You know, we're talking, you know, the pure blood of the grape. You can compare that, right? But it's red. His garment is red. And when Jesus comes back, that's how he's going to look. This is what I want to end with. When Jesus comes back, he's not going to look like how most people think he's going to look like. And there's probably a lot of Christians that are real confused about this. You know, I'm sure there are a lot of Christians that have looked at the picture of Caesar Borgia too much and thought they were looking at Jesus. There are a lot of people that are very confused and, and even saved believers that maybe are so confused they think Jesus had long hair. They think he's going to be this soft, feminine man. Jesus was a manly man when he was on this earth. Manly, masculine man. He was a carpenter. He was, I mean, has anybody done framing before? I've done framing a lot and framing is a difficult job. But furthermore, he was a framer 2,000 years ago. Has anybody ever seen a, a, a wood manual drill? You ever seen them before? Anybody? It's got a drill bit on it. It's like an auger bit because you have to have a real sharp auger bit. Look it up. I've drilled holes with manual. I had to do it when I, when I uh, was in training at Cincinnati Bell. And I drilled a hole with a manual drill one time. And it's exactly what I'm doing like this. It has a lever on it where you got to spin this thing. And the only reason why that thing's going down is because of the pressure you're putting on it. It's got like a small little thing that you put your hand on and you push down and then you start spinning. And it uses, you know, the, uh, the, the shape and the form of the drill to auger out that hole. Drilling one hole, most people in here would be done. That'd be a work day for them. He was a carpenter and built houses, framed things. I mean, that's what he did daily. You know, you have to be in very good shape. Very good shape. I'm sure Jesus was a very built person. I'm sure he was in very, very good shape. You know, uh, he was a manly man is the point. He was not a sissy. And when Jesus comes back, he's not going to look, you know, like how people depict him. He's not a pushover. Jesus was not a pushover. When he's going around and people are saying things that are wrong, he's rebuking his disciples constantly. Thou fool! Just constantly, hardly correcting and harshly rebuking his disciples. Rebuking the Pharisees. He's walking into places to the point where people are like, you know, isn't this the guy that they're trying to capture and put in jail? And lo, he speaketh boldly. He's just walking into the temple just preaching to people. And just like, as, as plainly as can possibly be. People, they're very confused about Jesus' appearance and who Jesus is. We need to understand who Jesus is. And when Jesus comes back, let me say this. It's going to be a very fearful sight 
especially to those who are on the other side right. and are on the other team. It's going to be very different than what they would expect to think about Jesus coming back. And I'll give you this, this one example, and then we're going to read Revelation 19 and be finished. My pastor was a framer. Uh, the pastor that I grew up with, uh, I'm, I'm actually related to him. And he's, he's a manly man. He's a big guy. He's like 6'5", probably 300 something pounds. He's a big guy. He's framed his whole life. He's a rough guy. And uh, he owned a, a large framing company, actually framed for a builder. And he was meeting the inspector somewhere. And he had this magazine that was just sitting in the, uh, the back of his truck. And the magazine had a picture, and I don't know if it was a t-shirt you could buy or whatever it was, but it was a picture of what we're about to read of Jesus coming back in Revelation 19. They drew that picture. Now, you shouldn't draw pictures of Jesus, but this guy drew that picture. I believe it was Peter Ruckman. And uh, uh, he drew the picture of him coming back on a white horse. This guy, who says he's a Christian, a devout Christian, picked that up and was looking at it. And Dave got out of his truck and was getting his stuff right, put his hard hat on and everything. And the inspector said this. He looked at the picture and he said, it looks like you have a different Jesus than I have. And he yeah. took it and he set it down in that truck. You know why? You know how you depict Jesus? He depicted him like Caesar Borgia. That's why this matters. You say, why would a sermon like this matter, the appearance of Jesus? That's why. I mean, maybe they did have a totally different Jesus. Or maybe that guy never reads his Bible. Maybe he is saved and he never reads his Bible. And he's and he, so... The idea... Jesus' real appearance is so estranged in his mind that when he sees what Jesus looks, back, looks like and is going to look like when he comes back is so foreign of an idea of what Jesus is going to look like. That's why this matters. I want you to look at what Jesus looks like when he comes back. Look at Revelation chapter number 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Not just one crown, many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So he has a vesture on. Vesture is like, a, like a, a, an outer jacket, if you will. He's got a vesture on that's dipped in blood. So it looks as if you've taken a vesture, or a vest, or a jacket, if you will, dipped it in blood, and then he put it on. While he's riding this horse, and it's just dripping. Just dripping of blood while he comes back. Eyes as a flame of fire. He's, he's clothed in white. We know he's got the white hair, right? His face is white, bright lightning. His arms, remember, is polished brass. He's a, this is a very, very fearful, dreadful sight. Look at what it says next. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Clean is the same thing as pure. That's another way to... You know, pure means clean. That's why I notice it's white linen. Then it says this in verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And then it says this. <clears throat> And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the all or of Almighty God. That's what Jesus is going to look like when he comes back. It's sure not going to be, you know, Caesar Borgia riding on a horse. This is the true Lord Jesus Christ. These are the things about his earthly appearance, and then we see his glorified appearance. And you know what? It's in the Bible for a reason. Amen. And God wants you to know Him. God wants you to know what He looks like, His image, His appearance. And when we discuss the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not just the appearance of a man. It is the body that the God of heaven took on. And that is His image. That's what God looks like. And we need to make sure that we understand. We don't let the world you know, delude our mind and confuse us with their pictures. They're always wrong. He didn't have long hair. You know, he, 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 he wasn't this, you know, just beautiful man sitting in an ivory tower. He was a man's man. He was a carpenter. It's a totally different type of, of idea of how Jesus looked. Go to the Bible. You, wanna, you have an answer, you, you have a question and you need an answer, this is where you're going to find it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for becoming man. We thank you for, for giving us so information.
so much information, dear Lord, and the details about your appearance, dear God, and, uh, and the details about how uh, dreadful you are and that we need to understand that you're a force to be reckoned with and that we should fear you as our God and as our Lord. We ask you that you would uh, be with us. Bless the rest of the day, dear God. Bless uh, the time out soul winning. Uh, we thank you for the time of the Harrisons here to visit us. We, we ask that you would bless the fellowship uh, that we are going to uh, have tonight and uh, bless the services to come later. Bless our church. Help us to reach many in the area. Help us to grow and uh, to, uh, to uh, be a, a church in this area that makes a big impact. And be with us and bless us, as I said, all the families that are here and anyone that has any injuries. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.